Greetings from New York City and Columbia Business School Executive Education. My name is Scott Gardner, and I'm very happy to be here today with Professor Catherine Phillips for the Why Diverse Teams Are Smarter webinar. Before we begin, if you'll look at your screens right now, a recording will be made available of the webinar. If you'd like to tweet about the webinar, please do so at hashtag CBSExecEd. And as always, if you have any questions, please upload those to the Q&A box and we'll get to as many of those as possible in the last 10 minutes and during the conversation continues. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Catherine Phillips. She is the Reuben Mark Professor of Organizational Character and the Director of the Sanford C. Bernstein and Company uh, Center for Leadership and Ethics at Columbia Business School. She's also served as our Senior Vice Dean from 2014 to 2017. She received her PhD in Organizational Behavior from Stanford and her Bachelor's in Psychology from the University of Illinois. She is the recipient of numerous professional awards from the International Association of Conflict Management and the Gender, Diversity, and Organizations Division of the Academy of Management. Poets and Quants named her one of the top 40 business school professors under the age of 40, and her work and insights have been featured in numerous media outlets and scholarly journals such as the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, and Fortune. In 2018, she was included on the On the Radar 2018 list by Thinkers 50 and became Academy of Management Fellow. Catherine, it's great to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. I know we have a lot of great material, so let's get started, shall All we? All right, okay, let's go. Okay, so we talk about diversity a lot these days. Mm -hmm. And again, like a lot of our topics, it can be a very diverse uh, or broad term. Yes. So for the purposes of our webinar, what do you mean by diversity? Yeah. So it is indeed true that diversity is a complex term, and it's been used by many people in different ways. Uh, the way I think about it is twofold. One is that there's some surface level differences that we can see. Sometimes mm -hmm. people call them social category uh, differences, where I maybe may things like race and gender. Right. Um, on the other hand, there's also deeper level differences. Uh, maybe your work style, maybe your, your knowledge, your perspectives about the task that we're working on. And I make a big assumption. One is that if we bring a group of people together to work together in a team. We're bringing them together because we're assuming that they're bringing some unique knowledge and perspectives and ideas and ways of doing things right. that would be beneficial for that team. If everybody knows the same thing, what's the point of having right. the team, right? right? So I make an assumption that there's deep level diversity there. And then the right. question is, what is the impact of having that surface level or social category difference present in that right. space? Right, mm -hmm. great. Okay, yeah. so let's uh, look at our first slide here. Yep. So when you when you look out there in the world, uh, you see headlines like this one. Mm -hmm. uh, this one here is actually from Credit Suisse, or so higher returns with women in decision making positions, mm -hmm. kind of arguing that research reports reaffirms that in fact there is a linkage between right. gender diversity and better results. Right. Um, one of the things that I try to tell people all the time is to be very careful when they are looking at these things. And mm -hmm. there are lots of situations where these kinds of results mm -hmm. um, are not quite accepted. Right. Right? Yeah. right. So this question um, that oftentimes comes up is like, why doesn't all of this research that's out there that right. links diversity with performance, why doesn't that satisfy? Why are people not believing this? Why are people not believing this research? Right. Exactly. Yep. right? Um, and I, I recognized early on in my career that I really wanted to try to understand, partially because of how I'm, I'm trained basically as a psychologist, um, I want to know if there's actually a causal relationship right. between diversity and outcomes. Okay. That is, if we put people together in a room and there's some surface level characteristics that are different between them, will that actually benefit the team in some clear way in right. the outcomes? Okay. Right. Um, so I've done I've done 20 plus years of research that mm -hmm. tries to answer this causal question. Great. Well, let's ask this then. The name of the webinar, how does it make us smarter to have diversity? <laughs> yeah. So this is actually a piece that I published in 2014, and then it was republished again in 2017 by Scientific American, where I tried to summarize uh, the broad literature out there, recognizing first that diversity can be difficult. Right. It can be very hard, and there can be some negative effects that come from putting people together who are dislike one another. Right. Um, but... If you, if you have the right circumstances, the conclusion is that being around people who are different mm -hmm. from you makes us more creative, more diligent, and harder working, right? right? Yeah. Um, and so let me tell you a little bit about how I come to that conclusion. Um, I do research that brings people together uh, to solve problems together as a team. 
Uh, and when those people come together, they make some individual decision, they have some perspective about the problem that they're facing, or they have some unique information that I've given them. So I know that they have some unique, deep level diversity, right, right amongst right. them. Um, and then I manipulate, what's the composition of the group? Right. Do they have surface level differences or not? Are they a diverse team in terms of those social categories or a homogeneous one? Mm -hmm. And I've done this now, you know, I've published 20 plus papers, I've done it with 1,000 plus people, where I've put people into these small groups, three to six people in the group, and I find results that look like this kind of over and over again. You know, first of all, I find that diverse groups tend to outperform homogeneous groups. Okay. That is, they're better able to get to the right answer. They're more likely to have the diverse, unique knowledge, perspectives, and things that they have deeper in them come out to the surface to be utilized effectively right. for the team's uh, performance, right? right? Uh, but when you ask people after they've done this interaction, well, how effective was the group? Did right. things go well? Um, how confident are you that you have the right answer? You see this opposite effect that is, that's shown here on the graph, right. where you see teams actually feel like they were that more effective when they were homogeneous, when the surface level characteristics were the same at, in comparison to when they were yeah. diverse. Yes. And they're more confident, right? And if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense if what, what's going on is when people get into the group and they see, oh, we're all the same, and they have an interaction that's kind of free of conflict, we're on the same page very quickly, we think, we did great. Right. We're really confident that we got the right answer. Right. right? And diverse groups that are going through, they have disagreements about the perspectives, right. they're bringing in unique knowledge that otherwise wouldn't be brought up, right. and they kind of say, well, you know, it was a little bit harder so for us to come to, to, a, to a, a, a conclusion. So the process is the problem, yes. right? And it's not the result. The result may have been better with a more diverse team, but that's they're right. saying, well, the process was difficult, that's so it right. couldn't have been a good... Exactly. Okay. That's exactly right. It's a yeah. bias, right? Uh, it's a so bias. This I really love. Now, you and yeah. I have known each other for a few years, and yeah. I've heard you say this before, and this really altered my thinking on diversity. So mm -hmm. let me just read this. Value is not simply because the people who are different are bringing different information, which is what we all mostly think yeah. as we go into diverse right. situations. But everyone changes their behavior when in the presence of diversity. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, so this, this actually, this conclusion is a really important one because the reality is uh, that my research has shown that it's even if the person who looks different mm -hmm. isn't bringing some unique information with them, maybe the information is actually already represented amongst the majority of the group that's there. Right the presence of that surface level difference right. triggers a different type of behavior. Mm -hmm. You actually now are looking for unique information. Right. You're more open to hearing those different perspectives. You, you assume that because we look different, right. we may think different. Right. And so you yourself starts to change your behavior. Right. So you know, let me tell you a little bit about this one study that's actually not my own. Mm -hmm. It was done by Sam Summers and it's a jury decision making study where he manipulated very clearly um, if the composition of the jury was all white or if there were s some whites and some blacks. So he had either six whites or four whites and two blacks. And the results of the research suggested that actually the whites changed their behavior in the presence of the diversity, right? Mm -hmm. In the presence of the, of the African-American um, jury members, such that they actually are more diligent. They actually recognize when there's missing data. Mm -hmm. They bring up uh, less inaccuracies. They actually recall the data more effectively. And so they actually are working harder. That's why I say right. they work harder right. when they're in that diverse context. Um, and you know, Sam Summers argued that part of the reason is, you know, could be in that particular context where race is an issue, that well, you know, I wanna be really clear that I'm not a racist. Right. When, and I want to work hard to show you that I'm really thinking deeply right. about this information. Right. My own research actually fires different. Synapses. It fires different yeah, synapses. Yeah, yeah. My own research actually uses all kinds of different categories. I've right. looked at um, I've looked at you know just minimal group differences. I've looked at political affiliation, et cetera, and you see the similar kinds of effects mm -hmm. that happen. So it's it's not just a I don't want to appear racist. It's is that. This person is different from me, and I need to think deeper right. about the problem. Um, and you see that in other research. So this this first um, bullet here talks about research that is with race, and the second one actually talks about research that we did with political affiliation okay. um, that actually shows that even before you go into right. your communication, more into the interaction, the interaction right? yep. more yep. than just the group interaction, right. that in fact you are thinking more deeply mm -hmm. uh, and more critically about the different perspectives that could be relevant right. for the problem that you're facing. So in this studies, we asked people, uh, 
we want to we want you to interact with this other person who has a different perspective than your own. Right. Um, but before you actually talk to them, we want you to just write a statement in preparation for the interaction that you're going to have with this person. And when we look at that preparation, it's 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 better. Right. They actually consider, oh, well, I have this perspective. This person has another perspective. Let me dig deeper into this situation right. and into this information to see, well, why do I think the way I do? And why might you think the way you do? And so then once they do that, they go in, they talk, they have better performance. Right. Right. It completely makes sense. You prepared better. You actually thought through the problem more deeply. Exactly. And just make sure I'm getting this correct. Also, yeah. if you're in a homogeneous group, would there be the tendency of, of members of that group to sort of hide behind uh, not taking responsibility because they're yeah. like, well, it's a homogeneous group. I'll let one person be a representative of the thought. Yeah. Right. Well, and yeah, so this, this, you're opening up the idea like I, I, we all have different perspectives. Right. It's very you know obvious, I mean, even if it's just surface level. Yeah. So I can't hide behind the fact that I'm just sitting back and letting what I think right. is going to be just a group right. thought. Yep. So it's going to fire those synapses it's again. It's really <laughs> interesting that, that sometimes people pick up pretty quickly when I talk about my research on the idea of groupthink. Mm -hmm. Because this research is very related to the idea of groupthink. Right. That when you are in an environment where everyone is the same, right. you know, you're less likely to question those different perspectives. Right. Uh, and when I've done this work, what I've seen is the person in that homogeneous environment who has that unique information, you know, the one I know they have unique information, mm -hmm. they're, less, they're less likely to bring it up right. confidently. And when they do bring it up, their peers say, what are you talking about? Right. We didn't have that. That must not be that important right. because we're all the same. We should all have the same perspective, right? right? So, like, what are you talking about? Right. And they're actually, um, it's funny that they say that the, the environment feels more hostile towards them yeah. than, a, than a diverse environment, right? right? Um, and so one of the things that, that I've concluded is here on the slide that diversity kind of jolts us mm -hmm. into cognitive action in ways that homogeneity just does not, right? right? right. Um, and the benefits that we get from actually being in that diverse environment become pretty clear. Right. Um, yeah. So I'm going to summarize, you know, kind of what I've said with this slide here, yeah. uh, where when we think about surface level social category diversity, right. right, things like race and gender, but they, they may be other things in your organization. Um, it could even be functional differences, you know, the, the marketing people versus the finance people. It could be, you know, did you come in with the, the current CEO or the previous CEO, oh, right? right? You know, right. we see no. that a lot in organizations. Um, and depending on the context you're in, it could be, you know, are you single? Are you married? Like right. there are things that become salient in particular contexts that might drive these kinds of effects. Right. Okay, so this social category diversity, it actually tr triggers us. It legitimates the presence of different, different perspectives. We expect there to be some different perspectives there. Right. Um, it enhances things like pre-meeting preparation that we just talked about, information sharing, something we call integrative complexity, which is just how complex is the problem. Do you see that, it's, that there's multiple sides to this, right, right to this issue? Uh, we take other people's perspective. We, we're more creative. And we actually put forth more effort. Right. We work harder, okay? So people work harder. Yeah. Uh, but if you look at this all together, you recognize people do work harder, but people are, we're cognitive misers. <laughs> and that is, we, we don't really want to work so hard, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? And we, we actually, that's where you see that result, like, oh, it wasn't that effective. Exactly. That goes back to the original slide. That goes back to the original slide, right? Um, and they may not value the process and feel good about the process of right. getting to that. To, the, to that outcome. Um, I'll tell you about one other, one other study that's not on the slide, and that is we gave people um, a transcript of a group conversation, mm -hmm. or we had them watch a little video of a group interaction. And we just simply changed the composition of who was in the group so that the group was either homogeneous on the surface or right. different. And there was a little conflict in the interaction, right. right? And then we asked people, how much conflict is there? Okay, um, and do you want to invest in this team so yeah. that it can continue to do its work? Right. And what people said was, even though the transcript was exactly the same, they said there was more conflict if the group was diverse than if it was homogeneous. We have this bias. We see this interaction happening mm -hmm. where people who look different from each other are conflicting with one another. We think, oh my God, this is horrible, right? <laughs> right? right. This is not good. I don't want to yeah. see this, right. Right? right? And no, I don't want to invest in this team any further. Right. Okay, so we end up, uh, getting in our own way, uh, and we, it stop our stop ourselves from being able to actually benefit from the diversity that we have. Right. And yeah. the assumptions that people are making going mm -hmm. into a diverse team, 
are so opposite of the assumptions going to a homogeneous team yep. is the, maybe the assumption is le- this is going to be easy. Right. And that's not necessarily true. That's not necessarily you're just maybe not being as effective because you're not you're looking at surface right. homogeneous. You know what yeah. I mean? Yep. Yep. That's that's exactly right. You're yeah. just not working as hard and you walk out. So it looks like, oh, that was an easy process, but that's it was right. just because you wanted to come to consensus because the that's assumption right. is, of course, we're all going to feel the same. That's right. That's exactly and right. That's not true. That's, not, that's true. not true. It's not true. Right. It's like that we should be expecting difference all the time. Exactly. Right. If we oh, changed exactly. our mindset to a mindset of difference is normal, right? And right? that, in fact, there's no two individuals that are exactly the same, right. that we should have some differences amongst us. Right. Can we find it? Right. Can we get it out to the table? Can we benefit from right. that, from those differences right. of perspective? And what is the, you know, I mentioned this in other, what's the North Star? Right. Where are we going? Where are we going? That's, you know, the, yeah. this is the process, but, you know, that's, right. we always keep that in mind. So. Yeah. Great. It's that, that, that working hard, and one mm-hmm. of the things that, uh, that comes through in the data is if you look at homogeneous teams, versus the diverse teams, the diverse teams take longer mm. to, to solve the problem, mm-hmm. okay? Now, when I've talked to people about this, they say, that's exactly right, diverse teams are so inefficient. They're, they're problematic because they, they take yeah. too long and you have to go him and haw in about, is right, it this right, or is right. it that? Um, and the reality is, in the studies that I've done, I give people a time, a time frame to try to solve the problem. Right. Say I give them 25 minutes. And they can finish as early as they want, as late as they want, they still get paid the same amount of money. Right, they still get paid the same. When the diverse the diverse teams take the twenty five minutes, they take you know twenty minutes of the twenty five. Mm-hmm. The homogeneous groups take fourteen, <laughs> yeah. and they're like, "We're done. We figured it out, well, and we're and we're confident yeah. we got it right. right." And the reality is, you paid them for doing fourteen minutes of work. Right. When you really wanted them to do 25 minutes. And the net result may not have been as and robust. And the net result, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And the net right. result may not have been what you wanted it to be. Right. So this, 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 this is an analogy that I use um, to help people think about what, do I, what am I talking about mm. when I say hard work? Um, some of us go to the gym. Do you go to the gym? I do. Okay. I don't. Shouldn't be raising my hand. I, I don't as often I as more, I should. I should I go more. We all should go more, I should be right? Honest. I should go more. Um, there is, there, but when we go to the gym, we go in an intention. Right. We go in with a desire to seek discomfort. Right. Nobody wants to be sweaty. Right. You know, the pain that we get when we're doing the reps and we say, okay, I got to do 10 more so I can really get that that twinge in the muscle that right. lets me know that muscle is working hard. Right. We take it as a sign of progress. Right. We take it as a sign that we're doing something right and there right. will be benefit that comes from this. Right. And that's the same way I think about diversity, that there's a, there are moments when you will be uncomfortable. Yeah. There are moments when you will disagree with somebody who looks different from you and you'll think to yourself, do they disagree with me because... We're different on right. the surface, or or do they really value and respect me? Right, right. Do they value and respect my perspective? Right. That discomfort that you're feeling is actually normal, right. and it's a sign that you are making progress. That's right. what I would like people to think about. You go to the gym, you have to be motivated to go, right? right? Uh, and we oftentimes avoid that discomfort, right. right? But the reality is we need to embrace that discomfort, and organizations and people who actually decide that they want to embrace that diversity I guarantee you, you will get some benefits out of that, right? And you, and if you, if you continue it and if you recognize that there are things that you need to do to make sure that the, the upsides outweigh the downsides, right? right? That right. you don't, that you're not in pain right. <laughs> when you're going through that right. experience, right? right? That you have some balance. In the same way that when you go to the gym, you have to have some balance. You can't just keep going and keep going and keep right. going and keep going. Right. You need to figure out how to find the balance for yourself. Right. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So, well, this is great information. Let's move on to the next one. So, we we received a lot of pre-webinar questions mm-hmm. about this. And, you know, one of the big themes we saw that the reality of it, even with those best intentions, even that North Star, right. it doesn't always happen. Right? <laughs> That's yeah. right. So That's right. It doesn't it. always happen. And we know, um, this is from some of my own research with women in STEM, We know that there are biases out there that get in the way of us actually capturing these benefits. So in the first part of my career, I think I would say I was probably one of the most optimistic diversity scientists out there, right? right? Right. That, that, you know, I I was uh, really looking for where could the benefit come from? What what is the potential, right? And so I've been very, I think, um, become well known for articulating the potential. And many people have used my research to kind of support the business case, along with some of that early work that I showed you that from places like McKinsey, et cetera, right? right? Um, And so 
yes, there is a business case for diversity. Yes, you can get benefits from it. But we know that there are these kinds of biases that are out there that right. get in the way of actually benefiting from these things. This is particularly from about women in STEM um, with some quotes here. You know, if you're perfect, we might accept you. But if you're not perfect, forget about it. Right. <laughs> right? Um, and not a whole lot is taken on promise. Right? I have right. to prove myself again and again. I'm held to a different standard than my male colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, th it's, it's hard to be in this environment where people People are mistaking me for the, you know, for the secretary, right, right? for the administrator. Right, right, right. Um, and so um, when we look at this, this research more broadly, we have to recognize that we have to do some work to mitigate these downsides, these biases, yeah, yeah. right? Um, so that's what I was going to say, like, yeah. what are a few strategies? Yeah, yeah. And then yeah. we'll get to some questions. So um, there's no perfect answer, right? Some people have asked me, like, what to do? What's the solution? And the reality is, I tell people this all the time, if I had the perfect answer, I probably wouldn't be here right now. I'd be on the beach enjoying my billions of dollars that I've made <laughs> because I've solved one of the most difficult problems out there. Right? So there's lots of strategies that people throw at um, these problems. And uh, what I'm just going to point out to you right here are some factors that have been identified very clearly to be important for kind of capturing those benefits of diversity. Um, so first of all, there you need to be open to innovation, change, and difference. You need to recognize that we're working on tasks that are complex and non-routine. Um, that is, you shouldn't necessarily expect benefits of diversity everywhere, right? Um, the relationship between diversity and outcomes, performance, is oftentimes predicated on what your strategy is, what your mm -hmm. goals are and what kind of task you're working on. So non-routine, complex tasks where you need to integrate unique information and perspectives and really hear um, and try to get to that innovation focus is where you should expect to get some benefits from this diversity. That's right. where things will play out the way that I have described, right. okay? The second thing is, in all of the studies that I've done, they've been people who are working in a team with a goal to solve a problem, not to debate their opinions, not to win, but to solve a complex problem that they otherwise wouldn't be able to solve if they didn't have one another's knowledge and perspectives. So you need to be focused on problem solving versus debating opinions. And it's really about we, it's about us solving this problem together and that having that kind of collectivistic perspective as opposed to, I wanna be seen as the best in this group, right? right? So you have to have some collectivism there. And then the last one is really important, and that is any time you introduce social category differences, you, you may be introducing status differences, power dynamics that have to be recognized and that have to be essentially minimized, okay? So when we think about um, characteristics like race and gender, we know that in society, those are in fact associated with status differences. Um, and we also know that other types of characteristics can be associated with status differences as well. Like some people are seen as better than others. Um, and so it's really important when you bring this diversity together to try to minimize the, those status differences. And there's a few strategies that, that, that people have shown uh, work. One is making sure that there's some equality of airtime. Don't let some groups dominate the discussion over others. That actually reinforces that status hierarchy and makes it difficult for people to actually capture the benefits of other people's knowledge. Um, second thing is you can do things in your own team to change that, that dynamic, that power dynamic. Things like having low status people speak up first. Right? If the high status people are the ones dominating the discussion again, you may, you may not get the benefits from that diversity. Um, a no interruption rule. When I'm talking, nobody else is talking, right? So that everyone is getting their equal airtime. And then finally, there's research that shows that um, even the rule that you have in place for how do you make the decision can make a difference. So remember early on, I told you about Sam Summers jury decision-making study where essentially in a jury, it's unanimity rules, right? It's like everybody has to agree. Mm -hmm. And that changes the dynamic significantly. If it's a majority rule, we don't have to listen to these people, right? right? And so even thinking about what are the norms of how we come to our final conclusion uh, may change the way you are able to capture the benefits of that diversity. Um, and so those, those are a few ideas, but of course the reality is, and I try to help people to understand, the problem is not diversity itself. Right. So people say, oh, you know, diversity, forget about it. It's hard. I don't want to don't want to deal with it. We know that 
diversity itself can have benefits. The question is, what are the things that are getting in the way of right. capturing the benefits of that diversity? Right. And those are things like biases, discrimination, prejudice, right? All right. of the isms right. that we talk about. Complacency. Um, complacency, say, yeah, right? Yeah. All of these things that, that, that get in the way of us actually capturing the benefits. Right. Those are the things that we need right. to to aim our, our target at, right. to try to make sure that we are mitigating those things. And you know, for some characteristics, it may be easier than others. Some people say, okay, Professor Phillips, that's all fine and good, right? Except these things are so ingrained in the mm -hmm. structures and the cultures and, and the way of doing things in organizations. Who, who gets the cushy you know, assignment? Who gets the next best client that comes in? These are all decisions that are made that are uh, that that are subject to bias, right? right? Mm -hmm. And 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 and, the, and limiting people's uh, opportunities. Right. So we have to be very careful to, to zone in on those issues right. to try to make sure that we we can get over uh, the right. the negative side, so we can get to the positive exactly. positive benefits that I, I guarantee you will be there. If and you the, do the people will see that that difficulty is a good result. You know, right. that, if there is difficulty, it's a good. Yeah, that's. Right. We have a lot of questions okay, coming great. in. Good. Now we're going to get to as many. We have about. Four minutes left right now, oh, no. but <laughs> we will be taping the conversation continues uh, after this, so we will take all Perfect. as many questions as we get to. But this okay. is a really good one. I'll try this is from uh, Juan. Okay. Will a diverse and heterogeneous group become homogeneous over time? If so, how do you maintain in the psychological differences among yeah. members? Group commitment seems to build group think. Yeah. I love that question. Yeah, it's yeah. a fantastic question. It's one that I often get, um, and I would, I would argue to you a couple things. One is healthy turnover is important mm -hmm. um, and that, that in fact uh, research has shown that healthy turnover is important for groups. And, and the second thing is um, what do you make normative in the group? When you talk to people, for instance, you're getting to know them, you're asking them how their weekend was, are you looking for similarity or are you looking for difference? And if you create a norm that difference is normal, right. that you did something different than I did this weekend and I want to learn about it, um, that it kind of continues to kind of keep that ethos right. present in the group. Right. So I encourage people, you know, don't hide the fact that, you know, you were off doing whatever you were doing this weekend because it kind of creates the opportunity for you to, to highlight that my, there are things about who I am and what I do mm -hmm. that I value, that are important to me, that may be different than yours. And right. we, we have to respect those differences. And with the turnover to keep making sure your hiring practices That's right. are thinking about this That's too. That's right. Exactly. It's very easy to fall into that sort of homogeneous hiring. That's right. You know, in Absolutely. every sense of the word. So. Absolutely. All right. Uh, we have a couple more minutes from Elizabeth. How does this data change by industry, if at all? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, we know that there are some industries that are that are a little behind, <laughs> that are kind of more behind others on the on their efforts around right. diversity. Um, and so the reality is, if, if you think about a particular industry, each industry has its own culture, it has its own history, it has its own structures, right? So you can imagine that an, an industry that has been always masculine dominated, like mm -hmm. tech and and uh, you know science, like right? STEM areas that are, that we know there's more difficulty with particular types of diversity, right. gender and, and racial differences, right. um, or when we think about you know. If you're thinking about a consumer products kind of company, maybe right. you won't have the same culture there and the same history. And so it really does. The, the, I think the history and the, and the culture matters. Right. All right. Uh, well, we have about yeah. time for one more question yeah. here. This is from Luis. Do you think that the better results of diverse teams serve for blue collar workers also, or is yeah. it just more for educated right. uh, executive groups? Yeah, this, this is, is, a, this is another really good question. Yeah. Um, the reality is there is a bit of a bias in the research that's done, right? So if we think about like where a lot of this research that you see out in the world is being done, it's being done at universities. So I'm, you know, working with educated people. Uh, so it's a it's a very good question. Um, I don't know if we have really good evidence to suggest that it won't work in blue collar in situations or that it will work in blue collar situations. But I think the dynamic that you have to be cognizant of is what kind of work are the blue collar workers doing, um, and how do we think the differences between them on the surface might right. be affecting that work right. that you're doing. So right. it's a question of what is the work that you're doing? Um, there's a question of uh, what is the culture like in that right. blue collar environment? And, right. and do you have stronger status hierarchies right. around gender and race and these kinds of things? Right. And what are you doing to mitigate that? Right. Um, you know, I 
think we we all have probably seen the story about GM that recently came out, mm -hmm. right? So we so you know we see that the context does matter, uh, and that the hope is my belief is that there are benefits that can be that can be garnered in any environment yeah. if you in fact understand the context that's that's impinging exactly. on those benefits. That's what I was thinking too. Yeah. it's just it's really yeah. relevant, you know, it's related really to related. whatever your context is, right? right to apply it. Right. Really. Well, this has been great. Lots of great information. I'm so excited to answer more questions with you during the conversation continues. Catherine, thank you so much thank for being you. with us today. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And thank you for being with us. Stay tuned for the conversation continues. We will send that along with this live webinar to you. Thank you. Thank you.